hypoxia inducible factor increases, ah, okay. When you're hypoxic, you know, ordinarily, you have a glycolytic pathway, which is anaerobic. You don't need much oxygen for that. You don't need oxygen for that at all. When you go into the Krebs cycle, you need oxygen. So in fact, what does HIF-1-alpha do? It increases glycolytic enzymes. So you're, the cells that are now far and distant from the blood vessel have an alternative mechanism. They can start use, utilizing glycolysis a little bit more selectively, and not depend so much on aerobic metabolism. So in, increased glycolysis, increased lact lactic acidosis turns out for, for reasons to in, increase invasive behavior. So instead of having neatly stacked hyperplastic cells, you start to develop tumors that can be resistant to hypoxia and can get bigger and bigger. And in fact, now I'm showing you a cancer here, because what happens is, and the cells become more irregular in shape, they don't stack up neatly, they lose cell-cell recognition, they become bigger and it becomes an oxygen gradient so steep that even at the end, of, at, finally when you get to a tumor that's too big, the cells actually become necrotic and die, but you can, they can still survive. So this is what a tumor looks like, and in fact, if you stain for hypoxia and inducible factor, this is a slide from Ebersole and investigators, you see that hypoxia and inducible factor goes up as the oxygen tension goes down. Here's the capillary, it's basically the same kind of arrangement as in the schematic. <clears throat> so, what occurs, can we decrease carbohydrate and starve the tumor? Well, it doesn't take a lot of, of uh, figuring out to realize this is not like I mean it was it's a nice idea and in fact it's the kind of thing that's very appealing intuitively but it's not like it because serum glucose concentrations on low carb diets even on starvation diets they drop but they still stay within the physiologic range which is 60 to 100 milligrams per deciliter or 3 to 5 millimol so you can't end and you know it's because of gluconeogenesis even if you're on no carbs at all the cancer cells are very clever about, well, first of all, they don't have to be that <laughs> clever if they have a mechanism. The way they're clever about pirating glucose from the blood is they end up expressing on their surface a glucose transporter called GLUT1, and as well as the, the, the enzymes, hexokinase, which phosphorylates and traps glucose in the cell. And by doing this, they end up saturating their, their uptake of glucose by 40, mill, 40 milligrams per deciliter. So even in the normal range, they're going to take up glucose perfectly adequately. It's certainly not the drop in glucose concentration that's going to do anything to them. And uh, most cancer cells, turns out, overexpress glucose one transporter and the hexokinase. Now, meanwhile, though, uh, thinking on another line here, but normal cells can use fat. They can use ketone bodies. They can use carbohydrate. So is it possible that the flexible metabolism of normal cells still provides some advantage? compared to the glycolytically limited cancer cells. And so, is it possible that carb restriction might have a role anyway? Well, first I just want to look at some relevant effects of a low-carb diet. Metabolically, and we'll see some slides here, but it reduces insulin, this is no question, as well as insulin-like growth factors, both of which are anabolic, not just for normal cells, but also for cancer cells. Fatty acid synthase uh, is inhibited and for reasons I'm not entirely clear, but it happens to be particularly important in cancer cells, even more so than normal cells, probably having to do, though, with uh, synthesis of cancer cell membranes. And drugs have been targeted against fatty acid synthase, causing apoptosis in breast cancer. Tumor growth is inhibited by ketosis and fatty acidosis, and I can show you some data on that. Now, we've also entered the world of modern molecular biology, where cell signaling and cell transporters have become very important and so apoptosis is a cell signaling uh, uh, event. And long chain fatty acids, which I mentioned over there, can, has been shown to cause apoptosis. Hypoglycemia, butyrate, a number of things can cause uh, apoptosis in cells. Inflammatory markers tend to go down on low carb uh, diets. And these also may play a role in enhancing uh, car uh, carcinogenic behavior. So the question is, are there actual data to show decreased cancer growth from carbohydrate restriction and its related effects. And I'm going to summarize it briefly here just to say there's not actually a lot, but there is, there is, there is data. Um, going back, a lot of it was 30, 30 years ago. Tisdale and co-workers uh, studied mice, and Fearon was in the same group. McGee and Potenzi back in 1979. <coughs> Moulton recently, that's in Don Lehman's group, 
the moderately reduced carbohydrate diet showed some uh, delay in, in the onset of uh, metastases. Tom Seyfried has been looked, looked extensively at low-carb models of brain cancers in mice. Uh, Friedland and Varopoulos at, uh, at, uh, Duke. <laughs> at uh, Duke have been looking at prostate cancer. Uh, cell culture lines have been studied in humans. There was a case study by Niebling et al. in 1995, which I'll get to just briefly. So there is limited data that supports the possibility. And this is the human study. I'm just going to report very, very briefly. It's the effects of a ketogenic diet. It's basically two case reports on tumor metabolism and nutritional status in kids. All right? They both had brain cancer, malignant astrocytomas. And I'm quoting from their article that within seven days of the diet, the blood glucose concentrations declined to low normal. Normal, though, remember. The ketones increased by a factor of 20 30 fold. And PET scans, okay, which I showed, showed you before, indicated a 22% decline in the tumor in both subjects in their brain tumor. Okay? And they, one of them continued the diet for 12 months and remained free of, of disease progression. And they also, by the way, they gained weight on the diet. Cancer patients is all good. All right? Now, a little bit on animal data. I'm going to quote from the uh, Tisdale study because I think it, it has uh, the most complete set of data. Now, you may ask yourself, what's a nude mouse? And uh, you think, well, aren't all mice nude? <laughs> no, except for their fur coat. Well, uh, a nude mouse just is bas uh, basically a mouse with a deficient immune system. Because if you're going to implant a human tumor in a different species, ordinarily it will reject the tumor because it's a foreign species. That's what the rejection phenomenon is about in transplanting organs or anything. So a new mouse has a, defu uh, a deficient immune system so that it will accept the transplant. It's a transplant of a tumor, a MAC-16 tumor, is a human breast tumor, okay? So then you can actually test in that model whether or not your drug or your intervention actually works and it's independent of rejection. And they, their, their study in British Journal of Cancer was reduction of weight loss and tumor size in a cachexia model by a high-fat diet. Just as, as an aside, Tisdale and his group, for 30 years now, have been mostly interested in cachexia, the wasting that happens in cancer patients when they get uh, you know, to a certain point in the disease. And that's what they were really more interested in. But they've had some other interesting results. Their standard diet for rodents, for mice, was high, 50%, pretty typical. And what they did is they substituted isocalorically fat for carbohydrate to maintain the calorie intake the same and they had five different variants on that. They implanted the tumor and then started the diet on day eight. On day 28, they sacrificed the animals and this is what they found. So there are five different diets. Okay, normal diet, then 68% fat, medium chain triglyceride substitution for carbs. 68% medium chain triglycerides plus beta hydroxybutyrate. All right, they added that as well, one of the ketone bodies. 80% substitution. 80% plus beta hydroxybutyrate. These are animals with tumor. They did the same in five different groups, each of five, five mice each, in animals without tumor. All the animals were about 30 grams, both groups. Okay. The final weight after the high carb diet was the lowest. They lost the most weight. The final weight in the diets that had the highest amount of fat and ketones was the best preserved, and that's. And they, they express that as the final rate of weight over the initial rate. So this is, what, you know, this is why they came, because they were interested in cachexia. They were trying to preserve body weight. And so they thought they showed that. But what they didn't expect is that the tumor weight also declined, and these were statistically significant values, in all of the animals on, on the, high, on the, um, the uh, fat-substituted diet, on the low-carb diet, and that um, and that the degree of reduction was in fact proportional to the degree of substitution. Of course, that doesn't apply to the animals without tumor. Furthermore, and I just want to make it move to the uh, letters in red here, just to show that beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate, the principal <coughs> ketone bodies, were significantly increased in these animals on the diet from a factor of about 4 to 10, and in both groups. Now, nowadays, you know, we're talking not just about metabolism, but about molecular biology.